All right, I think we're uh, right at two past the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the New Mexico Smart Grid Center webinar on science communication. I'm Selena Keneally, EBSCOR's Education and Outreach Manager, and I'll be your host for this webinar today, along with Brittany Vanderwerf, our Public Relations Specialist. I've got a few housekeeping items before I introduce our speaker. First, I want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website, nmepscore.org. Next, we're going to have time at the end for audience questions. And at any time dur during this webinar, you're welcome to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And Brittany and Allison will field those questions at the end of our session. We also are going to be using chat uh, today for the webinar. And you'll find that um, on, your, uh, on your bar as well. And finally, I'd like you to mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will be on September 23rd at noon, when Seth Bloomsack from Penn State will present a webinar entitled Carrots, Sticks, and Other Smart Tricks in Making Energy Consumption Smarter. So it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome our speaker from Explora, who's our project collaborator for public outreach and communication. Alison Brody is a friend and a longtime collaborator of mine, and she's also the Explorer's Director of Education. She has a doctorate in ecology and bi biological education from Idaho State University and has run out of school education programs since 90, 1998 at the Bronx Zoo, Oklahoma City Zoological Park and Botanical Garden, University of Las Vegas Public Lands Institute, Clark County Wetlands Park, and Explora. Although Allison's expertise lies in STEM, much of her work has centered around effective, compelling STEM communication. Whether facilitating a multicultural outreach program for Hispanic families with UNLV, or helping STEM professionals engage people of all ages and backgrounds through the Institute for Learning Innovations Portal to the Public program. Welcome, Allison. There we go. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that, Selena. Um, okay, let's get started uh, with a little bit of an activity. Um, I have a strip of paper here, and I'm just going to uh, make a loop with it. I'm going to take some tape, uh, and I'm just going to tape my loop here thusly. And then I'm just going to, uh, with a pair of scissors, cut down this, uh, the middle of this strip of paper. Um, okay, just like this, cut it down like that. And not surprisingly, uh, the, what we re, uh, end up with is two different loops. Not very surprising. But if I take a different strip of paper, and for this one, I'm going to actually make a, um, a mark, I'm just gonna draw two different dots here, one on one end, uh, one on the other there. Um, so I've got uh, my two dots right there. And then instead of uh, making a single loop like this, I'm going to twist the paper, just kind of a half twist right there. And this might be fun if you all think about if um, uh, for this particular loop of paper, what might happen if I cut it exactly as I did before? What am I going to end up with? So let's, uh, first time I cut it, I ended up with two loops. Now when I cut it straight down the middle, uh, my cutting skills are wanted. I have a single loop that's a Mobius strip. Uh, it's got a twist right there. So a single loop Mobius strip. Let's do this one more time. A single piece of paper. I'm going to draw my two dots on it, one on each end, thusly. And now, instead of doing a half twist, I'm going to do a full twist so that my two dots are facing the same way. All right. 
And now I um, think if I cut down the center of the strip, again, we have a single strip of paper uh, um, all three times, but now I have this full twist on it. Now, if I cut down the center, uh, what do you think I'm gonna get? Uh, so the first time was two loops. Uh, the second time, uh, the Mobius strip. This time, let's see what we got. Uh, if you want to put any ideas in the chat, that would just be absolutely awesome. All right, I'm just cutting down the center. It's a little bit more tricky now. Plus, I'm trying to keep it straight. Oh, good grief. Here we go. All right, cutting down the middle. Anybody have any ideas what I'm going to end up with? Two loops connected together. All right. I'm, oh, uh, we do have a chat. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> nice, Brittany. Thank you. All right. I'm going to do one more. Um, but this is cool, right? Uh, a nice little party trick. I can do one more. Uh, this time, I'm going to do two loops. Uh, so two loops of paper i'm going to tape uh so i'm taping one loop together so there's my one loop i'm going to have a second loop together tape that thusly and then um i'm going to put my two loops uh, you might want to put um, uh, a speaker view uh, rather than gallery view so you can sort of see because definitely you're going to want to try to try this at home. Uh, so I'm going to put my two loops um, perpendicular to each other and then I'm going to tape it at every spot where the loops intersect. Okay. So I'm going to tape it there. There. So there's gonna be four pieces of tape because there's four intersection points. All right. And then I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm going to cut down the center of each of these loops. And again, uh, what do you think I will get? Let's give it a shot. So I'm gonna cut down the center here. End up with a sort of a handcuff-like thing right there. And I'm gonna cut down the center of the other one. Try to be straight here. And boom, out of two loops, we end up with a square. All right, so what on earth does this have to do uh, with science communication? Uh, this is what we call a discrepant event. Um, it's, uh, it's something that is discrepant to what it is you expected. It's something that's surprising. Um, a discrepant event can be a demonstration. It could be a question that you ask. Uh, you know, what animal goes through a thousand teeth or 10,000 teeth in its lifetime? It could be a statement that you make that's surprising. Anything that elucidates that surprise reaction. And how this is useful in, in the context of science communication is that um, surprising events are, is an excellent strategy uh, to get your audience into this inquisitive scientific mindset to really foster that sense of curiosity and compel that, that I want to know. It's like, what just happened? Uh, it, I just really want to know um, what's, uh, what might happen if I try something else. What might happen if I try three loops of paper? What might happen if I try two complete um, uh, twists on the paper? Um, what is the presenter going to do next? And using strategies such as discrepant events is important because when we communicate about our science to the public, it's often in a setting outside of a school setting. Uh, whether you're talking about graduate school, uh, uh, um, undergraduate uh, teaching in, in, uh, in high school, um, 
but this type of science communication often takes place in non-formal, non-school situations. Uh, you might be talking to a, re a reporter, you might be um, tabling an event, you might be doing an outreach program, uh, you might even be trying to explain your science to a family member or somebody that you met in a grocery store. And so um, this idea that communicating science outside of a school setting uh, is, uh, might be different, it's worth looking at the, 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 the possibility of those very two different environments. What is different about it? Let's think about this for a minute. What are some similarities uh, between conventional instruction that might happen in a school or formal education and science communication that might happen in an informal setting? What might some of those differences be? Um, if you have an opportunity, go ahead and put some ideas in the chat. I'm actually going to stop sharing for a, for a minute, but put some idea um, in the chat. You can definitely have science content in both situations. Can you remind way, us of the question? Yeah, so the question is, um, what are some of the similarities and differences between conventional instruction in a school type setting and science communication that's happening in an informal non-school setting. Another way of thinking about that uh, is asking that same question from the audience's perspective. Um, one might label um, this table as a captive audience versus a non-captive audience. What's the difference? And um, share my screen again. Um, in the school setting, the audience is captive, right? They are there. In a non-school setting, uh, the audience is more voluntary. Um, and it turns out that difference uh, makes a big difference. Uh, let's take a look at this. Um, this comparison uh, originally uh, was uh, done by uh, Dr. Sam Hamm at the University of Idaho. And uh, these are some of the uh, similar, uh, really some of the differences that he identified uh, between captive audiences in the school setting um, uh, and a non-captive audience. In a captive audience, uh, the time commitment is often fixed, right? They're there uh, for this time. Um, external rewards become important. Uh, and because of that, uh, you have to pay attention that, you know, the professor is going to put, uh, get, uh, have this on the test. I have to pay attention. Otherwise, I'm not going to do well at the test. Um, the captive audience is more accepting of a formal academic approach. Uh, and they definitely because of those external rewards, because of this extrinsic motivation, they're going to make an effort to pay attention because they want that grade, they want that diploma, the certificate, the license, maybe um, uh, it's a captive audience in a job situation, in a job training, uh, maybe money's on the line, uh, advancement is on the line, uh, maybe success uh, um, uh, with, your, with your colleagues is on the line, uh, but all these factors uh, uh, feed into that external, um, uh, extrinsic motivation of the captive audience. Compare this with the non-captive audience. Um, a non-captive audience is there voluntarily. They don't necessarily have a time commitment. External rewards are not as important. Rather, the intrinsic motivation becomes extraordinarily important. Um, and think for a second what types of things might motivate somebody to pay attention. They don't have to pay attention. Uh, there's no, uh, there's nothing extrinsic holding them there. So what kinds of intrinsic motivations uh, might feed into a, a non-captive audience? Um, this is an audience that definitely expects an informal atmosphere and a non-academic approach, and they're totally going to switch their attention if they're bored. There's no reason not to. Um, there's no test looming over them. Um, uh, what are some ideas that people have about uh, intrinsic motivations that might hold somebody there and motivate them not uh, to, to remain um, engaged in, in the science communication? Brittany, do we have any comments? Um, 
Yeah, we've got, it looks like Dr. Jen uh, says that they care about the topic. Um, Andra says information that directly relates to them. Uh, Dave says, uh, what does it mean to me? Um, nice. And that's, yeah. Nice. Um, and those definitely uh, make the list uh, is things that are self enriching, uh, things that are um, uh, allow people to improve themselves. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, learning is about uh, your life and in, in achieving a better life. And so it's those things that sort of feed into those deeper um, uh, feelings as well as everything that, that you just said. Um, fun, entertainment, uh, those are also uh, things that would uh, feed into that. Um, the key part here is that if they decide, if the audience at this point uh, decides to pay attention, it is only because they want to. So it's up to us as the communicator to make them want to. Uh, so keep these two differences in mind, the extrinsically motivated captive audience uh, versus the intrinsically motivated voluntary audience. Keep these um, uh, differences in mind as we think through what the um, implications are. Um, this is a model that was uh, originally uh, uh, developed and, and I've adapted uh, from uh, AAA, AAAS. And um, uh, when we as scientists do presentations, we often follow a format such as that represented on the left side of this model. Uh, so, um, you know, you spend quite a bit of time on the background information, um, some of the supporting details, uh, and then you reach uh, the results and conclusions and, 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 and you really have this sort of more form, formal approach. Uh, so for example, if you're doing a presentation about lasers, uh, you might start talking about, well, background information, how do lasers work? Uh, how do I, I need to explain how lasers work? So you might talk about electron valence shells, coherent wavelengths, other background information. But let's go back to that um, voluntary audience. What is it that's going to capture their attention and make them want to listen to it? Is it really electron valences? Is that really the way to go um, uh, to capture their attention and again, uh, keep them wanting to be engaged, wanting to listen to, the, to you? Um, and the answer is often no. It's not how things work. Uh, it's, it's like, what is the bottom line? You've got a laser for heaven's sake. What's cool about a laser? What are they capable of? Uh, what can you demonstrate with a, with a laser? Why should I care? Uh, to Dave's point, what does this mean to me? Um, so uh, definitely uh, flipping that triangle is, is one of the first um, um, uh, considerations uh, when thinking about uh, successfully engaging uh, an audience in a non-formal setting. Let's see here. This model is another model of, uh, of communication that, that I've seen many times, I'm sure you have as well. Uh, and what is being presented here is essentially a one-way flow of information. Uh, the assumption being that the speaker's messages are being received whole cloth by the audience members. Um, but this doesn't really take into account, you know, and yes, they have that little, you know, maybe there's some feedback coming back to the presenter. Uh, but this really, this model really doesn't take into account what we know about how learning actually happens. Um, what is actually learned by the audience? Um, it depends on what is going on in their individual brains, um, how engaged they are, uh, whether they're emotionally involved, um, how, will they, how well they are able to integrate the message uh, with their prior experiences, um, their knowledge, their values, their feelings, um, uh, and, and just sort of where it is they are today. Uh, so we're going to go through each of these uh, bold points, brain chemistry, engagement, strong emotional stamp, integration, um, uh, 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 one step at a time, um, and uh, uh, see what uh, the research tells us um, about what happens in each uh, step of the way. So in terms of brain chemistry, um, 
what we know is that pleasurable thoughts actually stimulate the production of endorphins and, and dopamine. Uh, these uh, chemi uh, uh, chemicals are addictive in the same way that uh, morphine is. Um, and so, and the brain really wants those hits. Um, and it wants those hits so badly uh, that if the brain is bored or it's being presented with a difficult subject matter, it's going to look for more pleasurable thoughts elsewhere. Um, and this is essentially what happens when we daydream. Um, daydreaming is an involuntary act. Um, and essentially what is happening is that the brain is a control of our intention. Um, and it's uh, such a powerful tendency of the brain to find pleasure that even if you're consciously, you know, I'm trying to pay attention, I know this is going to be on the test. Um, if it's super boring or uninteresting or I can't engage with it or it doesn't make sense to me, um, the brain, uh, again, that, that brain chemistry um, uh, is going to want to uh, uh, take control. So going back to that um, uh, voluntary versus involuntary audience, if, the, if you have an involuntary, I'm sorry, if you have a voluntary non-captive audience, this is huge, right? As a presenter, you have to go, I want to, to present, uh, I want to um, create my communication uh, experience in a way uh, that's going to stimulate that, that brain, uh, it's going to stimulate enjoyment, uh, it's going to keep people engaged. What else do you have to think about? Um, engagement itself. Um, Motivation, extrinsic and intrinsic, um, and interest uh, influence what people choose to learn. It's huge. It's a huge influence. Um, and learning is highly effective when learners are engaged in experiences that are relevant to their lives. Uh, they can um, imagine, um, uh, again, it's like, a, I can, this is going to make a difference. This is relevant to me. It's age appropriate. Um, it makes sense to me. Uh, it's compelling. Um, and it's not just motivating, but it's intrinsically motivating. Um, and there is a, a lot of really compelling research out there that indicates that learning that is intrinsically motivated is more lasting and more effective uh, than learning that is um, extrinsically motivated. And I can, uh, uh, I'm looking at this young man in, in this photo um, doing this, this chemistry activity. And I'm thinking of my own experience with chemistry, which was all formal and pulling these all nighters. I don't, I mean, four years dedicated to chemistry uh, that really I didn't have that much to show for it and what I actually learned. Um, in this case, uh, with this young man, uh, what we also know about learning is that it's rarely linear. It takes place over time and space. And so um, it's almost never this instantaneous, uh, you present me about chemistry, I'm going to learn what it is you present me. That sort of whole cloth uh, model of, of learning. Um, rather, it's this sort of unfolding cumulative process uh, versus continuous accumulation of experiences, of ideas, of different sources of information at different, it happens at different times. Um, uh, you know, maybe you have a relative that becomes ill and you are motivated to learn um, uh, the, the, uh, the chemistry from the context of different medicines or vaccines. Um, maybe uh, as this young man, uh, you have this opportunity to have this fun experience uh, uh, with chemistry. What's important here is that this young man uh, may not be learning a lot of chemistry content doing this activity, but the experience itself is literally going to stick in his brain and allow other experiences to be added onto that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, some um, uh, some learning theorists, uh, uh, you know, have an analogy of like little hooks in your brain that literally these experiences um, have need a place to hang on. So if you don't have an existing hook in your brain for an experience to to lock onto, it's going to be less effective. And so um, in this case. Uh, what as as a provider uh you know as a, as a science communication provider for this young man 
I'm not less worried about what content he's getting and I'm more concerned with what it is that I can add to what he knows and understands about chemistry. How many hooks can I help to create in his brain uh, that will be available for later knowledge in later experiences to add on to what he knows and understands uh, about chemistry. So in this case, I want to create an experience um, uh, that's engaging, uh, that's relevant, that's compelling, that's motivating, uh, that, and that is likely to um, uh, create um, a su success for future learning experiences. Um, and if one last point about this is that learning is, is a way of responding to the day-to-day -day experiences of our lives, right? Um, so it's not just learning about facts and concepts. Um, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. So as science communicators, the more that we really understand, uh, how, you know, it's connecting with our audience. Uh, what is it that I can do to connect with our audience? Uh, the more successful that we're going to be. Uh, questions so far? Uh, we don't have any questions. From awesome. I will carry on. Um, emotional stamps. Um, you know, and we often uh, don't uh, uh, give learning experiences, uh, we don't often think of them as a, these emotional things. Uh, but it turns out that the limbic process, uh, I'm sorry, the limbic system is, is, um, is tightly um, bound up with learning experiences. And uh, so there's these like feedback loops that exist between these emotional states and learning processes and memories are a function of what happens in these uh, feedback um, uh, loops. And so a system that combines these uh, sort of higher mental functions, uh, I'm sorry, so the, the limbic system is a system that combines like these higher mental functions and emotions. And it's that combination uh, that's going to result in this, whether uh, the learning experience is going to be strongly held uh, or if it's going to be weakly held. And if it's weakly held, it's just going to sort of disappear over time. And so the bottom line is, is that the stronger the emotional value to a learning experience, the better the memory is going to be, the more lasting that learning experience is going to be. And so again, this is uh, uh, how, do we, how do we take this into account when we're thinking about communicating science? Um, uh, you know, things that are uh, experiences that are fun, that are playful, that are enjoyable, uh, that are strongly rewarded um, are going to have that stronger emotional stamp, as well as uh, experiences that are collaborative in nature, uh, that maybe it's like a challenge. Um, you know, I, I want to succeed. Uh, a challenge is awesome because it really taps into that intrinsic motivation and that emotion because I want to succeed. Uh, so those are ways to uh, receive that, that, that strong emotional, that high emotional value as part of that learning experience. Um, and then finally, uh, integration. Uh, play is an integrating mechanism. Uh, and it helps the learner make uh, important connections amongst things they learn, uh, they know, they feel, they understand. Um, there's a, a lot going on in somebody's life and uh, the learning experience that you have sort of has to fit into that. And so providing uh, these playful experiences can help make that stronger integration in everything else uh, that's going on in, in somebody's life. Again, it's, it's not just uh, about their learning, but it's that um, what it is they already know, the prior experiences they're bringing into it, uh, their values, um, uh, what it is they already think they understand about something, uh, what preconceptions they have uh, that may be right, that may be wrong. Um, so another aspect of integration is also really understanding where your learner is at, uh, giving them the opportunity to tell you these things. Um, and this can be as simple as asking uh, an open-ended question before you start a presentation, like, what is it you know about lasers? Uh, you can learn a lot about where your audience is at uh, and how they know and feel about a subject uh, just by starting off with a couple of those open-ended questions uh, to begin with. Um, uh, and you'll end up 
uh, being able to more successfully integrate it if you're able to respond to that. So not only ask those open-ended questions, uh, but have a couple strategies in your back pocket so you're able to respond uh, to what it is that, that, that you hear um, from the audience. Um, so uh, finally, um, uh, this is a, a, a statement that, uh, that I absolutely love. Uh, this is, uh, again, from uh, Dr. Stan Ham, uh, who um, uh, is a, um, a learning psychologist and, and uh, has just spent a lot of time uh, working with uh, communication in informal settings, um, especially in uh, national parks uh, around the world. And, uh, you know, from all of his work, uh, he has boiled it down to this one sentence uh, that uh, good communication or effective communication um, it has to capture your audience's attention. Uh, and in, in, you know, so all those things, uh, what are you going to do to capture their intention? Uh, how are you going to respond to them personally? How are you going to make it age appropriate? How are you going to uh, make it relevant to them? Um, and then how do you successfully make your point? Uh, it has to be uh, compelling, it has to be fun, it has to be engaging, um, it has to um, uh, make somehow a, a, a connection and integration point uh, into their lives. Um, and so, um, and I did, uh, I uh, have got plenty of time for questions right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, just sort of the bottom line is that effective science communication um, definitely actively engages the audience, but it's not just about incorporating an activity, right? It's the entire approach that you take to communication that's going to matter. Um, so how is it that you take into account the motivations, the interests uh, of your audience, uh, the emotional connections that you can make um, uh, with the audience, uh, and really being satisfied uh, with meeting the, the, the learner where they're at, um, not necessarily where you want them to be. Uh, where they're at is where they're at, right? They're exactly where, you know, if you just sort of accept that this is where they're at, um, and my job is just to add to that uh, in a way that's going to set them up for success uh, uh, in, in continuing that learner uh, over time and, and, and through space. Um, I've, uh, so, uh, as Selena was, was talking, uh, Explora is, um, is working with, a, a New Mexico EPSCoR, uh, and, and smart grid staff, uh, uh scientists and, and others, uh, around this idea of communication. Like, how can we help, um, uh, you know, the important work of communicating uh, successfully about the smart grid uh, to as broad an audience as possible. And so um, uh, some ideas that we have uh, is, um, uh, is, is, is essentially sort of this holistic approach, so this multi-layered. Uh, so one is uh, we want to create these uh, mini traveling smart grid exhibits. Um, and we need your help in planning and, and designing these. And so beginning in October, um, uh, we will invite you uh, to a couple of uh, what we call design charrettes. Uh, these are essentially um, uh, listening planning sessions uh, where you get to contribute ideas in a really open-ended way. Um, it's really fun uh, and it's a great way just to to uh, develop sort of uh, uh, these sort of broader thematic uh, topical uh, approaches that we might take uh, with these exhibits. Um, uh, then we'll take what we learned uh, from these uh, design, design charrettes. Uh, again, we hope that you consider participating in October. Uh, we'll take what we learn uh, to um, uh, create a couple prototypes, uh, show you all those prototypes, get some feedback from you all, uh, work with some audience members, get some feedback from them, uh, then uh, uh, iterate the design um, and end up with uh, um, uh, between uh, three and six of these uh, for the spring. Uh, then what's going to happen is we're going to actually use these smart grid exhibits, uh, not just here at Explora, uh, but you will have the opportunity to use them um, 
uh, for your public communication of science uh, throughout um, uh, New Mexico or wherever. As well, we're going to work with other um, museums and other institutions uh, to bring them to public audiences there. Um, and we would uh, definitely appreciate um, uh, any help that we could get in actually facilitating those exhibits in those different settings. Because uh, again, it's not just about those exhibits, it's also about um, uh, the opportunity to interact with real STEM professionals, uh, real scientists such as yourself. Um, other opportunities we have to engage the public, uh, uh, New Mexico Science Fiesta is coming up. Uh, Selena's got uh, uh, the save the date postcard for that. Uh, that's uh, coming up this September. Um, we will have a, a science communication workshops uh, coming up uh, this spring. Those will happen either in person or virtually. Um, we'll start those in January. Uh, and we will actually have an emphasis on, on Southern New Mexico for those, especially if those are in person. Uh, we'll try to bring those uh, 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 down to Las Cruces. Um, we would love to highlight uh, um, smart grid scientists in meta scientist videos. These are less about what it is you do explaining uh, what a smart grid is and more about you as a scientist. Uh, meeting a scientist, uh, um, if people are able to break, apart, break down some of those stereotypes that they have about who scientists are, what scientists are like, uh, that science is boring, that science is all about, you know, electron valence shells. Um, and science is this person who has this compelling story to tell and this cool pathway story about how they got to be where they are and they're doing this important work. Um, those are the kinds of things that come out in those videos. Um, so we would love the opportunity to, uh, to, to um, uh, to interview you all. Um, we'll be doing some teen science cafes this year. Uh, we're unclear as of yet what those look like. Stupid pandemic. Um, as well as uh, um, uh, opportunities uh, to um, uh, bring you to students um, uh, through either like a meeting up with a, 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 with a classroom or um, a sort of a, as a role model um, in other types of events. Um, you ready for questions? Yes, I am. Awesome, because we have a few. Um, Dr. Jen wanted to know um, where the quote you, where the quote came from that said, "Good communication captures your attention and successfully makes a point." Um, yes, let me uh, grab uh, the book. Um, uh, hold on, I'm looking it up right now. Um, uh, the book is called um, Interpretation, Making a Difference on Purpose. I'll put that in the a, in a chat. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we also have other questions. I'll let you type that in. All right. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sarah would like to know any observations on how COVID has changed your approach to science communication? Has engagement increased? Right. Um, and, you know, that's a really good point because good communication is good communication um, regardless. Um, certainly, you have to think about engagement a little differently. Uh, in some ways, I've been really pleasantly surprised at how um, uh, virtual does not exclude uh, the, uh, the, or, or preclude the possibility of being hands on. Um, and so, for example, that, you know, this quick activity, uh, we've done this um, virtually with uh, adults and with students. Um, it's materials that you easily have at home. Um, uh, we've done like design challenges uh, virtually. We've done uh, computer science um, uh, virtually. Um, it's just a matter of getting the materials in the hands of the, of the, of the learner and in some ways, what we've learned, the advantage of this, um, of this uh, uh, format, the virtual format, the advantage is, in some ways, it's more accessible. Um, I mean, look at this right now. Everybody across the state can participate. Um, you don't have to drive anywhere. You know, it's just like right there. Um, it can be hands-on if you plan accordingly, either using materials that are um, at home 
or we, uh, we if we do this um, uh, science communication training virtually, uh, we'll be mailing uh, participants uh, kits so that they will have those materials uh, and then they'll just be participating at home. Um, if you work at make, uh, um, learning tends to be a social endeavor. Again, that's uh, what contributes to that strong emotional stamp. So you have to consider that. How are you going to still make this social? Um, and this webinar sucks in that way, right? It's like, uh, you know, we've got the chat, uh, but there's no real opportunity to collaborate. And so using um, uh, uh, features and, and tools uh, for collaboration uh, becomes really important. And then so in Zoom, maybe that's the breakout room, maybe it's a Jamboard, uh, Mural, uh, uh, mural.co. Um, has some really cool collaboration tools, um, collaborating on a PowerPoint slide. Uh, you know, there's just different ways to do that, but it's still possible. Um, so, you know, again, as long as you sort of take those things into account, um, it's, uh, it's still possible. Um, but yeah, there's things that suck about it. I don't Thank know if that answered the question. I think it, it gave a general overview. Thank you. Um, so we've got two different people, we've got multiple people actually, um, involved on getting, are interested in getting involved. Uh, how do they get involved with these opportunities that you mentioned? Awesome. Um, I will um, work with Selena. We'll get a couple of Google Forms going and uh, we'll get you guys uh, uh, loaded up for bear. Um, Outstanding. We have another question and um, how will we will get the information to y'all if you're interested, maybe just put your email uh, message us your email um, in the chat. I, or, I'll put my email for people. Uh, to email me. Thank How's you. That? Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea, Selena. Thank you. Um, another question we have um, is Andre wants to know, do you have any good suggestions for communicating to those who may be coming from a place where they actively distrust scientists or may have a bias against your research, vaccines, clean energy, et cetera? Right, right, right. And that's, uh, that's definitely where we're at right now, right? Um, it's like a science communication on the one hand has never, ever been uh, so important. Well, Maybe it has, uh, but it's definitely uh, so important right now. Um, and there seems to be a trust level there, but uh, you know the whole politicization of it. And so this um, holistic approach becomes important. Um, and so the science fiesta is an opportunity to again um, directly address uh, stereotypes um, and. Um, uh, preconceived ideas that people have about what science is and who does science and where it happens and how science is integrated into a community. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why New Mexico EBSCOR uh, supports the New Mexico Science Fiesta as one of our sponsors is that we are able to um, address that through a couple different ways uh, by showing just a huge varied um, array of different types of science um, and, and different types of scientists uh, and where it's happening. Uh, we connect people with, with the opportunity to actually talk with real scientists. Uh, so they see scientists as people. Um, uh, we give the scientists an opportunity to role model and engage directly with the, with the, with the uh, people. Um, uh, NSF has funded some evaluation of science festivals uh, in the um, 2015s, I believe. And uh, some of those evaluation results uh, uh, really demonstrated the efficacy of, uh, of meeting real scientists in exposing people to science in that way. Another thing that we do in Science Fiesta is that we flip science on its head. We reframe it. It's like uh, we're going to have some break dancers there uh, and look at the science behind break dancing. And so that way, um, we're, we're trying to reach people that don't just self-identify as the science nerd. 
Uh, we, we need to reach beyond that. If that's all we reach, then we're always going to be in that same tunnel. Uh, we need to reach people that, that don't necessarily identify themselves as, um, you know, somebody that's interested in science, uh, but it's like, hey, breakdancing is cool. And oh my God, I never thought about, um, uh, you know, the, the way that the, the momentum and, and um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, I've lost my nouns, it happens, um, uh, you know, the uh, center of gravity and how that affects a, a break dancing. And, and uh, you know, now that I'm listening to this, uh, yeah, science is kind of cool. Um, and just, you know, giving people the opportunity to put themselves uh, in the position of enjoying science and enjoying scientists. Um, the Meet a Scientist videos, again, by focusing on scientists as a person, uh, rather than uh, explaining what it is you do, is another way of addressing that. Uh, and again, there is some uh, research that um, uh, demonstrates the, the efficacy of, of that approach in, in broadening. Uh, in, in, it, it does, I, I don't think there's, efficacy, there's been demonstrated efficacy in um, impacting people's trust of science. Uh, but definitely, um, it broadens their uh, their view of science and um, and has the opportunity to impact how they value science. We oh, the questions are rolling in. All right, so um, we have a question um, that is asking which or sorry, how would you suggest approaching the topic of effectively communicating scientific ideas? Um, depending on audience, in a succinct manner to high school students. Right, um, and uh, and this is awesome, and this is from uh, Shafiq, how are you? Um, uh, right, this is awesome because we, um, uh, the new science standards are all about science practices. And so um, engaging students uh, with phenomena um, uh, and having them um, ask questions and see what happens if I try this. Uh, um, but it's about the facilitation. So yes, the phenomenon is right there, uh, but the facilitation of that phenomenon uh, becomes the important aspect of engaging them with those science practices. Uh, and that happens through open-ended questions. It happens when you, as the science communicator, um, it's less about explaining what it is you do and more about um, facilitating the interaction with that phenomenon. Um, uh, so that's, that's what I would suggest. And that's definitely a paradigm shift. Uh, awesome. Um, we have a question in the Q and A. Uh, I think it, I think it might be asking um, for advice on training scientists so they don't scare people away uh, from yeah. colloquium lectures. Um, do you have anything on that? Or any suggestions for scientists um, so they don't scare people away with their lectures? Right. Well, and it turns out that, you know, if we um, really take to heart uh, the research that tells us that intrinsic motivate, intrinsically motivated learning experiences uh, are super powerful and super effective, uh, then we would tap into that intrinsic motivation regardless if the audience is captive or, um, uh, you know, if it's in, in a classroom setting or not. And so utilizing uh, these strategies um, uh, uh, is a, a great way to make science accessible, relevant, and meaningful uh, to all of our audiences. And really, that's what we have to do. Um, there's a, um, uh, my degree is, a, is a, a doctor of arts, it's not a PhD, it's a DA degree, and the idea behind that degree was to put people uh, that were trained in teaching uh, in front of undergraduate students uh, so that, uh, um, you know, we have that opportunity right from the get-go uh, to get people interested and motivated and excited about a subject area. Oh, we have a hard question here, but it's a good one. It, it, it kind of riffs along the same thing we've been getting. Um, Austin wants to know, what's the best way to communicate or persuade scientific realities to someone who is not scientifically literate or in denial? Um, 
Right. And um, getting people to do things is hard. Um, and actually, that's uh, uh, Sam Ham uh, has been spending uh, quite a bit of time uh, working with, uh, for example, Park Service uh, to try to influence uh, behaviors, uh, you know, with, um, uh, with the general public. You know, how do you influence um, what it is that, that people um, might, how they might behave, uh, their actions, like whether or not they recycle or, or uh, whether or not they um, uh, take, uh, uh, you know, like petrified wood out of uh, a petri petrified forest national park. Um, but you're also talking about how do we influence what people know and, and, uh, and feel. And that's hard, right? Um, we know that uh, people come by their values <laughs> over a lifetime. They come by them honestly. Um, and they are where they are. Uh, we have to meet them where they are. So we have to sort of um, reframe this. Uh, and it's not about what it is I want them to know and understand. Uh, it's about um, uh, working together to understand each other. Like, why would, should I listen to you if you won't listen to me? Uh, you are telling me all these things about global climate change. Why should I listen to you if you've never talked to me about my experiences um, and my understandings of, um, of, uh, of, of how climate has affected my, my families and my family's farms and, and, and ranch uh, for generations? Um, and so it's reframing that whole thing is about having conversations uh, rather than uh, one way communication events. It's about, again, um, we're not gonna change people's values uh, just with one uh, communication event. It's, it's, uh, it might happen, it's gonna be extraordinarily rare. Um, and in fact, uh, what research has shown is that we might accomplish exactly the opposite of what we set out to do by trying to do so. Uh, because people will, uh, tend to entrench themselves in what it is they already know in the values they already have. And they'll tend to believe it even harder uh, in the face of, of conflicting uh, information. And so it's not about throwing information to people. Um, it's not about throwing uh, facts at people. It's about having conversations. It's about engaging with them. Uh, it's about having experiences together. It's about meeting them uh, where they are at. And being satisfied with that, that's where we have to start. Um, um, and, um, but the more we have those conversations and the more that we're willing to listen to each other, um, there's been, uh, the Park Service is, is uh, for a while, uh, was doing a lot with um, uh, community dialogues, especially around climate change. And there's some really interesting uh, papers um, and um, approaches uh, that, that really seem efficacious. Uh, so um, that would be a, uh, something that would be, um, uh, takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of intention, uh, but that would definitely be um, uh, one approach. Wow, what a spot on answer. Cool. I, that is fantastic. Thank you so much, Allison. We do actually have another question in the chat from Cynthia about whether there's any website or resources that you might uh, recommend. And so, Allison, as I'm wrapping up, maybe you can put some of that into the chat because I know you you know the answer to that, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll get this wrapped up. Thank you so much. I think uh, I can probably speak for all the audience that this is the most interactive webinar I've attended in uh, many months. So we appreciate that you practice what you preached, and uh, we can't. We'll all virtually give you a, a hand uh, in appreciation. Thank you, Allison. Nice. Thank you. So I want to just finish up with a couple of uh, commercials for things that are coming up that uh, can, you can w use to help hone your own science communication or be inspired. And Allison mentioned the Science Fiesta, which is coming up. It's, uh, it's a week long celebration of science, September 18th through 26th. The website is going to launch on Friday, but we've given you a, an, an advanced peek and there's the URL where all the the great stuff will be. There's live events. There's also be a number of things that are recorded and people can access at any time. So um, go ahead and, and uh, save that date and, and share it widely. There's no registration on the, I think the platforms for access are, are super accessible like YouTube and, and Facebook. Anything else I should say about uh, Science Fiesta, Allison? 
Um, no, we will get you uh, um, uh, more information. I'm sorry, I'm like uh, madly Googling because uh, um, I want to share this website and I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> Okay, so uh, go ahead and, and Explorer will certainly be pushing out all the informa information about the Science Fiesta. So look forward to that. And you can see that Upscore is a sponsor. So we're really excited that it's moving ahead in the virtual space this year. And then finally, I wanna remind you about this uh, webinar that will be coming up in September with Seth Bloomsack, and he's a fantastic communicator. So I think you'll really enjoy learning about his ex ex uh, expertise as an economist and connected to the smart grid. So with that, I think we will say goodbye. Allison, are you, have you been able to get your things into, into chat? Or, we, or shall we keep it open for a bit longer? Um, <laughs> <Not to put. laughs> yeah, let's, I'll just uh, uh, give me a, a one minute. Okay, well, and so um, one thing I would recommend to everybody, the science communication training that Allison is planning for January that EPSCoR is helping to sponsor is open to scientists across New Mexico. You don't have to be associated with the Smart Grid Center. And so we would welcome your participation in that. And if you're interested, go ahead. I put my email into the chat and you're welcome to email me and I can make sure that you're, you're on the list to get more information uh, about that training coming up. And uh, Brittany is a is an alum of that training, so she can she can vouch for how impactful it is and, and useful. And um, we we certainly have have space to accommodate uh, scientists from across New Mexico, and that's our intention. It's an awesome training, everybody. <laughs> so uh, anybody who's interested in seeing the, the information from Allison, please hang on and we'll get that posted in the chat. All of the rest of you all who are ready to go on with your day, we thank you for attending and uh, hope to see you again at Science Fiesta and next month at our webinar. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>